Welcome to Miha on the Mic, where me, Miha, interviews daughters of immigrants and immigrants themselves who are making moves in their industries around the world. So today, I am so excited to invite podcast host and author and comedian and so many other things, Sadia Asma. So thank you so much for joining me, Sadia. Hi, Laurie. Thank you for having me. Thank you for, for existing already. Oh. Um, Sadia inspires me so much, so I'm really excited to, to talk to her today. So we go way back, right? I think when we met, it was maybe, I hadn't even started Ochenta yet. I was like just a freelancer, I think. So it must have been like 2017, 2018. Yeah, I think it was 2018. Exactly. We met at this like really cool podcast festival. Mm-hmm. And Laurie was just really like kind and um, supportive, and that's really rare in the industry. So I, I definitely we just kind of kept in touch, really, um, over different questions and stuff like that. And um, I love that we're in different locations, but it doesn't really affect like us being able to communicate. Laurie is just so generous with her time. Yeah, no, and also I was gonna say that something that I connected so much with you is that. Um, like your experience as a daughter of immigrants is very similar to mine, even though we're in different places. Mm. So I always thought that that was really, really interesting because, you know, when I was starting to do my research for other shows and even doing the second and third seasons of Miha, I was always thinking like, you know, this is a truly relatable experience, regardless of whether or not you're Latina or if you're black or if you're, you know, wherever your, your background is, there's so much that people can relate to when it means, you know, when you're talking about being bicultural and then living in a country that's not necessarily your home country um, culturally. So I do want to get into all of the podcast things and all of the book things. But before we do that, I always ask all of my guests to kind of break down what their cultural background is. So if you can kind of tell our listeners, like, why Sadia, who are you? Where are you from? <laughs> the, kindest, the kindest way for me to ask the, the where are you really from question. <laughs> yeah, but I feel like we can ask that. And yeah. um, it reminds me, I, just to kind of signpost the fact that we, that's the other reason that we really connected is because both of us were doing um, something that was quite new f- for the industry. And in fact, like just people in general to talk about um, the things that we were covering. So that was pretty cool. Because like you said, it does feel like, um, it's not new to you, but because it was a very new conversation out loud, it felt very new, um, which is weird, but it was good that we did it. Um, so where am I from? I'm from, I'm like, basically the way I, what doesn't, what doesn't cause me to flinch when I describe myself is like British Asian. Um, and there's not, an, there's not a reason for that order. It's just like one of the delineations on our forms or whatever. So obviously British born in the UK and Asian because I'm brown. Um, my family has like origins from India, but um, yeah, I guess because I was born in the UK, um, the British Britishness is kind of really intrinsic to who I am. Um, and I feel like, I don't know if anybody can just be 50-50. So if I had to say, I think that the Indian side kind of took a bit of a, <laughs> a beating. No, it took a bit of a, um, uh, yeah, it just basically took a bit of a backseat at times because I guess I was really afraid of like having to have an arranged marriage. And so I was like, okay, if I'm more British, that might not happen. Interesting. So you actively kind of rejected that side of yourself, maybe? Would that be right to say? Um, yeah, I mean, definitely parts of it. And like, obviously, looking back, it's regrettable. Um, but unfortunately, like I say, I really don't know. I mean, maybe now things are different, but I don't know then how easy it would have been to do like literally a 50-50 split. Like, what does that even look like? Like, you know, Mm. um, how many people of like Asian origin were I was able to speak to? And does that mean speaking like 50-50 different languages? Does it mean watching 50% Asian TV, 50% British TV? So I feel like you do have to sometimes you you choose sometimes not everybody but I chose to make a compromise and um like it was my my parents are very British as well and so I think it wasn't something that I felt was wrong to kind of do because they were very settled in 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 England and so it felt okay for me to kind of do that and um I guess this is gonna sound really stupid but watching lots of Bollywood movies and stuff where it was like quite high drama and people crying and like you know it was you know, these um, 
gang warfare and stuff like that it just felt slightly mellower and obviously I wasn't in that country I was here so it was another reason to kind of feel more um affiliated to this country but like I do feel like you pay a price like you know obviously I'm not as fluent in in Asian language or Urdu Hindi as I would be um I can somewhat somewhat understand it but I'm not as fluent and so um yeah, I guess, you know, we're, we're, it's very cheeky. You know, you take the food, you take the flavor, but, you know, um, there's only one person, you're only one person, so there's only so much you can kind of um, commit to all of the other things, right? I don't know. I felt I didn't feel bad at the time. I think also we have to survive, and I think that if you feel that survival looks good, unfortunately like this can sound really bad but like in asian communities especially outside of the uk that the british passport or being british is so like highly revered and so um it almost didn't feel like there was a need to kind of um explore those indian side of my roots um so again maybe that's something i learned is that you know British culture is like fine it's just it's one culture it's not like the only culture but I think mm -hmm. um yeah I don't know sorry that's a bit rambly no not at all I think it's super interesting because you're it, everyone's experience is different and you know uniquely so because of whatever the context is that you grew up in so you grew up in London right yeah so you had this context where there were a lot of other Asian immigrants. And so you maybe didn't have that kind of questioning so much because you had a lot of other people who were having the same experience and maybe didn't have to ask themselves so many questions about these things. Cause it was like the Indian community is very, very present in the UK. Right. Yeah. And also to be honest with you, I feel like all of this kind of um, analysis is, is a luxury slash privilege mm -hmm. that I, we've kind of grown into being able to do, but I don't think that my parents, um, had that same luxury or pr privilege to do so i think their luxury and privilege was being allowed to be in the country and then just try and work and su survive and sustain themselves and and hopefully flourish and and you know um do good for their family which is which was a big kind of kind of ambition for them so i just think yeah times change and like the times that we're in is to kind of be a bit more um rounded and nuanced whereas i think that their human rights obviously was problematic for people of colour, towards people of colour, I should say, um, back then, like 50 years ago, let's say, 50, 40 years ago, whatever you want to say. So um, I don't know that these kind of, there would be space for the conversations that we're having today or that they would be welcome because the rhetoric was very much at that time, go back where you came from. And my problem with that is like, where the hell is that? because <laughs> I can answer the question where are you from but it's like go back where you came from where, where the hell is that because I'm not really from it, it depends how you want to look at it yes I was born here but am I from the UK and like I just said I don't know much about my Asian culture so whilst on some level or on paper I might be is that where I'm from like I don't even know like if someone told me these days to go back where you're from I would literally need to have a conversation with them about trying to help me find out where the hell that is mm. that's really interesting so <laughs> you wouldn't be able to say like what feels like most like home to you no because well I mean I know what it feels like to me but also I know that there's so many caveats that come along with that and so like in the UK I think it's openly known to be such a, a diverse melting pot I hate that phrase but it's, it's basically a place where everybody like there's no kind of uniform uh way of life or kind of majority as such like I think is very mixed um, and a lot of people just come here for work um, and that's definitely something that makes it rich and beautiful and fun but also if if belonging and um, community is important to you I'm not really sure that it ticks those boxes all the time or, mm -hmm. or often or at all. Wow so Tell me about No Country for Young Women, because that's like the first entry point into your work and about you talking about these questions, because there's there's something really nuanced about the way that you talk about culture and and how we're kind of individually and collectively affected by these immigration journeys of our families. Yes. So I would like to hear, like, you know, tell me about Why No Country and the title and, you know. <laughs> 
All so basically, I was doing stand-up comedy and um, one of the BBC commissioners, who's really amazing, thank you for commissioning us, um, uh, commis- com- contacted me basically and wanted to see if I had like an idea for a podcast. Um, they were releasing their new pa- platform, which is now known as BBC Sounds at the time. And um, the idea I had was basically that like I sound British, but I don't look British um, and what that kind of even looks like. And we needed a co-host so I kind of like um asked if like my friend could do it my friend Monty Onanuga um she's Nigerian descent um but also had the same we met at a call center so we're very much our voices were our um kind of a lot of our work similar to what you're doing I guess with podcasting but like that's our voices were the main things that people heard or noticed about us but then our names were ethnic like Sadi or Monty they, they're not English sounding typical names well Monty is but her her full name is Motorayo I, I hope I'm pronouncing that right she'll hate me if I don't so sorry Monty if I'm not saying that right M- Motorayo anyway um basically our names are ethnic and so we would often get asked questions like where are you from or um like what's your background or yeah basically just stuff like are you married just things that people feel it's okay to just like kind of pin down people who aren't white about um and so and it's not that I have problems answering these questions but when it's a stranger on the phone you're kind of talking about their car insurance or something it is a bit it's a bit much so um they commissioned it and we were really fortunate we had four series where we interviewed like great um contributors and celebrities and guests from from all walks of life and it was really really eye-opening in the fact that um, a lot of our guests who like some of them were British had moved on to like America and stuff and they were like well I couldn't have these conversations when I was in the UK so I was really surprised but also I don't know why because we weren't nobody was really having these conversations in the UK and I think um it just it just spoke a lot about how that you can you know about you know how we have to come like you can't always bring your full self like people have expectations sometimes unspoken expectations about um you and you either choose to live up to them or then choose to surprise them or or kind of just be yourself and then I think in the case of ethnic people what that means is that you you can compromise your seat at certain things you know whether that's your career progression or other things um and it's not like I'm trying to say that things are so hard and that I'm not trying to be divisive but it's just not that inclusivity isn't like isn't um I don't know I think it's it's a it's not kind of you're not able to be I think it's basically conditional. It's conditional on circumstances. It's not guaranteed is the word I was looking for. Sorry. So inclusivity isn't guaranteed. Um, It just depends. And uh, like that means our existence has to be, you know, we have to be really, um, we have to kind of try harder. We have to think harder. We have to feel less in some ways because we have to be stronger. to be accepted and to to survive in many environments where we're maybe not accepted or like I say people just sometimes just want versions of us and so I think one of the things I'm really thankful that we got to explore on No Country for Young Women was was deciphering you know where we felt comfortable where we had felt less comfortable just so that people could understand like um navigating those spaces because a lot of people i'm talking about white people now a lot of people don't understand their own biases and prejudices and so sometimes they deny that they exist or they expect ethnic minorities to explain them for them and um i think i've got to the place where look i'm open to have conversations but they're sometimes learning that other people can't do for you yeah I'm sorry, you sounded like you were going to continue. <laughs> I know. I, I paused no, really no. randomly in, in places because I felt like I'd been talking for ages and also I felt bad that I was talking for ages. But I guess the point is, is that it's such a hard conversation. So I really salute you for the work that you do because I think on the one hand, you want to give people hope, people of colour, you want to give people hope that they're 
that they're as important as everybody else and that things aren't as bad as they used to be and that they can thrive and that their existence is way more than just certain things that the industry or the world monetizes because let's face it diversity is like unfortunately still monetized so it's it feels as though like if you're talking about it then you're kind of trying to cash in on on something or adversity but it doesn't mean it, it I guess like this is really like organic and isn't doing that but I think that there's often times where I think especially from my experience in stand-up like it feels like that's all they want is like a victim narrative and so I do find it hard sometimes to talk about these things because like it's not a game to us like this is just a lot of our reality and and things that we've had to kind of overcome and so it is really challenging because on the one hand you really want to give people hope but on the other hand like there's a reality as well in terms of um the world that we live in and um we just it for me it's like racism isn't something that we're able to ever put a full stop on and move on like it's always just this ongoing ever since i was a kid like you know i watched stand up chris rock talking about um racism and race and i don't know like yes it's great that people aren't being killed anymore but are are, are they not being killed anymore <laughs> or and and if they're still alive are they still like what kind of battle are they going through um and should the bar be that low and so it just feels as though it's something that constantly is with us and is hard to conclude basically and so yeah it's just a difficult one to reconcile and I'm not sure that we'll ever get rid of racism. I, I have a question for you and I, I think it will help also have the listeners understand your experience a little bit more. Okay. Can you tell me um, maybe about an anecdote or something that I would say best represents um, the way you feel on a daily basis as an Asian woman in the UK? Maybe so, a memory or a moment. Um, it could be when you were younger or now. Not necessarily has to be a negative memory. It can just be something that represents your bicultural experience, despite, you know, whatever percentages that you, you said that you had. Um, <laughs> of course, you still have one or the other, and you're always going to have a blended experience. So I would love to hear a little bit more about, okay, what is a typical day maybe for you, Sadia? So what it is, is I feel like my childhood was really amazing. And um, like I went to a school that was very diverse. And I think as children, like, well, myself anyway, I should speak for, I didn't really think of colour that much. Like I had friends from all different backgrounds and I didn't even care what colour people were, right? You, you're you not that co colour conscious. Um, then when I was 19, I started wearing the hijab, which is like a head covering. And... Um, it was surprising because I thought like, because it's such a big change that I would have like loads of people ask me so many questions, but nobody did. So that was cool. Um, but then ISIS came out and um, that's like not a cool boy band. That's like a really evil terrorist group. <laughs> and um, terrorism was like a real big problem in the whole world. Like there were so many unfortunate fatalities and um, we were all very very afraid of what was going on like the way that the media was portraying it as well and um it felt like a very big divide between like muslims basically and the rest of the world um even though like muslims denounce terrorism and what it stands for and i definitely like as a muslim as well like didn't support anything like that but because of lack uh, because there was such a lack of um understanding um of what islam was um i guess the media sloppy portrayal of a lot of those kind of events um didn't help the people who weren't so educated in different cultures or communities or um religions and faiths so i think like what has kind of made me more stand out is my headscarf which is obviously like a um symbol of my faith and so like it's a bit kind of torn because like mostly it's not a big deal but i think when those um attacks or or kind of things occur that are quite um you know awful it can make it can make everybody's fear heightened and cause a lot of division and stuff and so it definitely caused a lot of conflict because I think the way like 
I don't think, again, that it was handled very well. And so it led to other microaggressions against Muslims, like, um, like you know, the burkini ban in France. It was like, well, if a woman's not comfortable in a bikini, bikini um because she you know doesn't often wear like that in public wear clothes like that in public you know what why would you put a ban on like a bikini um which is a shame and so some women just wish to dress a certain way and also there was hijab bans and then there was so much like bitterness and anger and it felt like we couldn't talk about the thing that we really needed to talk about so there was all this other stuff going on mm. um and i know it's not easy because like who's going to start a the conversation there's pain on both sides like on the other mm -hmm. side obviously like victims have been like literally hurt um and on the muslim side it's like well you're stereotyping us and this isn't us and so i could see both sides and i think that doesn't answer your question in the least but <laughs> i think i think i don't know what to, i don't i don't even know how to answer your question in terms of like i yes they've been really good times um I think, okay, this is probably going to answer your question. So I can't remember. I probably did wear the hijab at this point, but it was not relevant. I would have white women come up to me and saying, hey, and I would be like, hey, and they'd be like, when are you getting married? And for me, <laughs> that's pretty much um, a big kind of um, memory in terms of me, um, my existence and my my kind of my position in, in this country where like people are white people are willing to have like surface level conversations but they don't really want to go deeper than that so it was obviously out of genuine uh interest but yeah it's just like who goes up to a stranger and just says like when are you going to get married type of thing mm -hmm. <laughs> it's strange and no, no context just like expecting you with the arranged marriage or yeah that's probably what it is like i feel like the asian experience is very much coupled with marriage and so it's like we're seen to be like the poster poster girls for marriage and literally look i wish i knew where my future husband was i don't know where he is i don't know who he's sleeping with i'm very upset with him but i'm <laughs> i'm single and um yeah it's just i think it's been confusing sometimes because like you have this roadmap of what your life should look like as a Asian woman, even an Asian woman in the UK. But then when your life doesn't meet that, then what does that mean? Does that mean you're a bad Asian or does that mean you're a bad woman? Like, does that mean you're not sexy? Like, what does it all mean? And so, um, yeah, I think it's, you know, I don't get asked that anymore. And I don't know if it's good or bad because I think it went from, weird conversations like that to like ignoring people or being ignored because people like looked down or they hated the hijab or they didn't understand like why I wanted to look differently or what it stood for and didn't want to have those more kind of nuanced conversations. So it went from weird conversations where they were showing an interest but didn't fully understand it or were just kind of like, you know, friendly, but like, nothing substantial to like feeling like you're an outsider in a community that you've been born and raised in and so I think COVID was great because it took a lot of the um stress out of that <laughs> for us because now COVID was the terrorism or you know I'm joking obviously Tech COVID was really bad everybody but I think it became public enemy number one and gave Muslims like a much needed break which is fantastic mm -hmm. um but then like you know I feel like things are okay when at the moment like when the media isn't ramming it down people's throats to hate Muslims and to kind of like be afraid of us or to other us when the media isn't basically othering us but then yeah I, I, it, there's still a lot of things that didn't really get resolved like I said earlier echoing my point about racism where it feels like things just pick up um kind of momentum is probably the wrong word but pick up momentum and then like dissipate a little bit when something else happens and then kind of like come back maybe I don't know so you, you just can never get too comfortable mm. I would like to talk about um you, you talk about relationships a little bit and I know that your book is very much around your identity as a woman and also trying to navigate these cultural questions so tell us about sex bomb 
your book? Yes. So basically, it's my memoir. It's my debut book. Um, and I was really excited to write it. Um, Sex Mom is everything about me. I spent two years like putting my heart and soul on a piece of paper, on papers. Um, and I talk about what, what is the sex bomb? Because obviously we all know the title sex bomb to, to basically stand for like a hot mama, right? Like a really hot chick, like a desirable lady. Um, and I, you know, I contemplate, um, whether that could be a Muslim woman. Could a Muslim woman be a sex bomb? Um, it's obviously tongue in cheek because I'm using like a bomb in the title, which Muslims have had like so much kind of, um, you know, uh, <laughs> association with terrorism and, and violence, etc. But sometimes it does feel like sex is weaponized, um, or that it can be a bit of a taboo subject. But I think the reason it was important for me to be bold and to write it was because I was just tired of like us being viewed one dimensionally and to be reduced in the media to being repressed and, and passive because none of the women I know, whether it's closely or just know of, are like passive women and we all kind of like are really rounded and for so long we've never had a narrative um we've always been spoken about by the press or spoken about by other people or had massive assumptions made about us and i, I really wanted the conversation to move forward beyond are you going to get married like so that we could be seen as rounded people and so i talk about um a relationship that was in um where I love this guy and uh, how that relationship was quite um, un, what's the word? <laughs> it was a, not even just unimpressive, but like basically it was a bad relationship. And I talk about that in the hopes that other women, cause it's not just about, obviously I'm Muslim, but it's not just a book for Muslim. It's not even just a book for women. It's a book for everybody. And um, we've all had heartache and we've all kind of had ups and downs. And I talk about like how I, got out of that and how I picked myself up. Um, and also like finding my self worth, like how I found comedy, I talk about my podcast. Um, and so it's really like, so many people ask Muslims questions like, you know, how do you like, do you have to, are you already married or do you have to wear the headscarf when you go to sleep or do you have to wear it in, in you know, um, if you're married or if you're single, why are you wearing that? Or do you have to wear it in the shower? You you know, so I answer every single question that you've ever wanted to know about a Muslim so that we can just kind of keep it moving. Um, and it's like literally out all over the world. So anybody can buy it. That's amazing. And I love that in the book, you're also talking about the comedy side of things, because these are obviously very serious subjects and there are so many nuances and everyone wants to, you know, say the right thing and say it in the right way. And I really appreciate that you're not afraid to kind of see the humor and how ridiculous it is that we're trying to be right all the time. Right. So I would yeah. like to hear about, you know, how you got into comedy and maybe if you can tell me about maybe your first set, I think it'll be fun to hear. Yeah, I mean, I love comedy so much. Like, I think people like Chris Rock spoke to me as a young child, like, just because I could tell that they were being real. And I don't know, it's probably because I'm from East London that I'm real as well. Like, I'd, I'd like to say I'm always real and I, I try to be, but I know that it's not always possible. Um, but I think it, comedy, comedy just allows tension to be diffused. And I think when people are relaxed, they're going to kind of engage with each other the most. So it's it's a very sexy um, profession, I have to say, even though I may not always be sexy, but it's a very cool um, rock star for me kind of thing. Um, and so I basically was always writing jokes. I was always being a bit of a clown. And so I found this open mic um, when I, when I kind of engaged with a comedian accidentally, I kind of like found an open mic and did a gig. Uh, and the first gig actually went really well. Like you hear loads of stories about gigs where the first one people bombed. Um, don't worry, I bombed a whole lot of times afterwards. So I'm not trying to say, <laughs> I'm not trying to say it was an easy road, but um, the first gig was like for 70 people, mostly women, and they all laughed and it was really cool. Um, and I guess when you start, you don't really know what you're doing. So it just feels like a whole bunch of fun. But then like with anything, like the more it means to you and the more you take it seriously, like the more you learn about yourself. And I think it's so character building. Like I know I did so much research on it and people often say that public speaking is like one of people's biggest fears, like probably if not the first one. Actually, I heard that people are more afraid of public speaking than dying, which is funny, um, or then death. So it's definitely not worse than death. 
And I encourage anybody to do it, especially people who are afraid, because you prove so much to yourself. Um, and I think we're all funny around our friends and stuff like that. So I basically just carried on doing it. And then it's a funny industry. So you, that's how I found the podcast. And obviously, I wasn't planning on doing a podcast. But it's one of those industries where you kind of just kind of try and be open to whatever opportunities come along. And uh, you see everything as an opportunity to kind of showcase your your humor, really. Um, so it's really fortunate to be able to do something that, um, you know, wasn't being a doctor, which was quite cool. How did your parents react when you wanted to be a comedian? So I never told them, Laurie. <laughs> With I, the book out and everything, you haven't told your parents? No, not really, because they're really, like, protective. And I was really concerned about, like them trying to talk me out of it at times like I don't know if they would like they might be super supportive but also it just meant something to me and so much of my existence seems to be trying to please parents and stuff and so it was the one thing that I wanted to keep for myself so then how do you do it I mean you had a whole podcast out of it do they I know the show have they read your book do they know <laughs> all very good questions Laurie and um you know what? I think I tried to subtly hint it, but my mum wasn't very well, so I don't think she really understood. And so I don't want to give her more to worry about because Muslims, like, you know, we gig, we don't, we're not allowed to even go to pubs, right? And that's where a lot of stand up gigs take place. So I guess I don't want to cause them concern. And so they haven't really found out, like, I guess they're not that down with the the podcasting yet. Um, so. They're not on social media. Your your mom's no. on Instagram, so she wants you. They're so not on social media. So that's probably how I've managed to keep it under wraps. Is it something that you're? I guess like your whole life, have you kind of had that duality where you you kept this kind of other side of yourself from yeah. your family in a way? It's really strange because the way that the world perceives Asian families is so different to my own experience. And that's why I never try and make assumptions. So I guess, and it might be correct, like the majority of Asians, like, you know, they're very close knit, they share so much, there's big families, lots of food. But because my family came over here, which is literally just mom and dad, um, because they came to the UK, like they didn't have that wider um, setting. So like they, it was just them. And like they really were just quite traditional. I think they just wanted me to do something that was quite kind of safe or, or simple and just pay the bills. And so like, I really just didn't want to be in the business of trying to persuade them because like, how do you persuade your parents, your Asian parents that I'm going to go to a pub today. I'm going to do a five minute gig. I might bomb and I'm not going to get paid. So it was just never something that was going to like, convince them of in my own opinion and then like obviously the other things came along which were nice but like again I don't know the podcast was quite new and so I didn't know how to explain that to them and then like yeah I just felt like they got to a point where I never really felt like I needed their approval and or understanding like they just didn't I think if they saw me on telly they might they might be like that's cool but again it's like I think the freelance inconsistency aspect of it might might make them a little bit uncomfortable and so I just thought if, if why open this can of worms so what do you what do they think you do I was doing um, a lot of admin I was doing some temping and so I guess they kind of just assumed that that's what I was doing but like I say like going back to the point is that like they were really modern or English in their upbringing and in a way that they raised me in that they didn't really like, they weren't micromanaging me in terms of where are you going? What are you doing? Da, 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 da. It was a lot of freedom. And uh, I guess because the world was telling me that that wasn't the case, I was a bit like surprised by it. And I didn't a bit phased by it because I was like, actually, my setup's pretty good. And, then, you know, you, you know, the whole, the way that the world sees you and the way that things actually were was so different. And, you know, now as an adult, you, you've now written a book, you've gotten forward in your career, you're kind of putting forward, you're owning your voice. Do you feel like you'll be able to come clean one day? I like to hope so. I mean, look, I'm on telly now and then. They might switch the cheap. I, I would, you know, in the improv and, and stand up, like there's always this saying, show, don't tell. So I think 
you know, actions speak louder than words. I would love them to discover me, like you said, with the book or whatever, like find out themselves. But um, equally, I'm fine if they don't like give a shit as well. Like I literally, it's just never been something where um, my mum, you know, her health hasn't always been that well. So I don't know. There was a time where I was on Channel 4 and I tried to tell her to like put the channel on and she just didn't want to do it. So like, it's cool. Like, you know, it's fine. So we're coming to the end now. I want to ask you some speed round questions. Okay, um, this is going to be fun. This has been such a serious conversation. So this is like a f- more fun side. Be Feel free to answer however naturally as you wish. Okay, so don't, yeah. don't think too much about the questions. All right, so <laughs> <laughs> can you give me starting now? So what's your favorite food? Huh? Favorite Chocolate. Food? Song you've had in your head this week. Ooh, uh, from time, Drake. What is your last Google search that you are comfortable sharing? <laughs> no, it wasn't porn, Laurie. It was, <laughs> um, that's a good question. I mean, I guess I was, I, <laughs> the lunar calendar. When is the best time to sauna according to the lunar calendar? Wow. And what is the best time to sauna? Um, good question. I think, let me just Google it again. I think it's like the 16, no, 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 I literally have it on my phone. I think it's like, basically, I don't want to lie to you because this is really important to me. Um, <laughs> this is so stupid. Uh, <laughs> okay, let me just Google it again. Um, best times to sauna, best times. Ah, come on, come on. I'm so sorry. You all like waiting. Best times to sauna lunar calendar. It should come up. It should come up. Ah, uh, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Please, please, please. Oh yeah, it's come up. So, um, thank you for asking. Um, okay, so it's uh the 17, 18, and 19 lunar days, which are obviously like you have to go by the lunar calendar, not the Gregorian calendar, 17, 18, 19. And the reason I look it up, um, because there's favorable days, there's good days, there's neutral days, and then there's bad days, and then there's the worst days. (laughs) So I basically didn't want to go on the worst days because I sounded like hell, um, and I don't want to upset my body. So yeah, that's why I I look it up. (laughs) What's your star sign? I'm a Pisces. We're like so problematic. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, what is your most embarrassing dream? Having sex with someone who was ugly. (laughs) Okay, what is your biggest dream that you had as a kid and that if you could do anything today, what would it be? Uh, What? That sounds like two questions. I mean, when you're a kid, like when you, if you, if you, you know, had no obstacles, like what was the biggest dream that you had? Oh, shit. I don't think I was a big dreamer. Although there were Pisces of dreamers. So what am I thinking? I mean, I had a, <laughs> this is going to sound bad. I don't know if I want to say it. Like, okay, look, I had a big crush on Robert Downey Jr. I would have loved to be his wife, but um, that didn't happen. Um, in terms of like, I don't know, like, I feel very fortunate in that I'm doing a lot of the things that I feel are kind of like almost like a dream. So like in terms of creating and um yeah in terms of doing stand-up like obviously i would love to do stand-up on a bigger scale like for a netflix special or hbo special or something that would be like a huge dream if i can hopefully get there okay um all right thank you for your time tell us where we can find you i'm living on instagram literally <laughs> so please follow me i'm at sadia underscore asmat underscore and um, you can find me on twitter but it's so miserable these days so i don't post that much um and also like please buy my book it's called sex bomb you can get it everywhere like i hate to promote just amazon but like if that's where you prefer that's where you can get it and um, but you can also get it at your local bookshop you can get your independent bookshop to order it for you they'll get it um i can also hand deliver it to you um and sign it or if you dm me on instagram we can arrange for me to post your copy um obviously you can pay for it that'd be great but yeah i'm everywhere follow me amazing now one last thing um i always ask all the daughters of immigrants to tell us their advice what is your advice for other women like yourself, young women, young hijabis, um, about you know starting to tell their stories and, and starting to take the mic and maybe doing comedy and, and being inspired like you? Jesus, Laurie, oh my God. What a big question and what an important question. So 
I'm going to caveat it with the beginning to say, be careful who you take advice from, because like, if it was that good, it wouldn't be free, right? So just there's some people who are on different paths or maybe a different journey. And so they may, it's not that their advice is incorrect, but it may not be correct for you where you are. So I just wanted to, I, I put that pretty diplomatically. What I really wanted to say is, <laughs> well, no, I'm joking, I'm going to leave it like that. So my advice would be, is that, you know, I think it's okay to make mistakes. Like, you are going to make mistakes and that shouldn't stop you from telling your story. Um, but try and learn from your mistakes. And um, unfortunately, I guess I guess the fact of the matter is, is that a lot of it, there is a game going on. And so I think you have to figure out what success means to you. Like for, for success, what success means to me is getting out more than you're putting in and especially in the arts industry i feel like there's such a culture of kind of um <clears throat> kind of like putting everything you have like literally everything expendable to you and working for free or for very little and so knowing your worth is really important and i think sometimes people don't know their worth and so, you know, it's so valuable to share your story and to learn about yourself because you'll grow uh, from this process. It won't always be easy, but um, it's like it's such a highly rewarding thing to be able to kind of um, show for yourself. But like, just know what's going on. Like a game is being played and know when that's being played you're being played or not and like it's not for me to tell anyone what decisions to make like again it could be completely depending on the circumstances um and the difference between you getting paid and not getting paid but also like for me i definitely have turned some things down because i prefer to sleep at night um so that's obviously not very specific but um just that you have worth. And I think sometimes daughters of immigrants didn't grow up feeling like they did or for, for whatever reason, like was giving so much to other people that it felt like um, at the cost of, of that uh, or reminding themselves of that. So I think what we do is really hard and great, but self-care is good and uh, not to sound boring, but like just do spend a little bit of time for yourself and just try not to overdo it in terms of how much you do for free or how much you give away of yourself without holding anything back for yourself. So you you are really valuable. You have lots of worth. It is a business where um, there sometimes is a lot of rejection um, and, and ghosting and negative um behavior um and i think trying not to take that personally is really important because um it's not really always i i think it says more about the person who's doing those things than it does about the person on the receiving end um so yeah just i think having a good set of values knowing what's important and um knowing understanding that things do cost and have a price and so deciding for yourself what those kind of what your boundaries are and what you're willing to do and what you're not willing to do would be good because often if you're saying that I'm not going to do this people can work around it but if you're if you don't have that conversation um and then you, you put yourself in a position that you didn't want to be in then that's very detrimental where it could easily be compromised and negotiated so um not not feeling, not being afraid of challenging things that don't sit well with you. Um, and yeah, I think I've said a lot, sorry. <laughs> and for the rest of the advice, go and check out her book, Sex Bomb, available in everywhere, everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Sadia. Thank you, sorry I was talking so much. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs>